let's say I found something that's actually good enough. Um, how do I analyze the business? How do I analyze the management team? The, the main thing is that I want to understand, are these returns on tangible capital sustainable? So I've looked at it before. I've seen that they have good returns on tangible capital. I've read about the business, and I've said, you know, I think I can understand this. This is something that I can forecast maybe in five years and 10 years. Um, the framework that I use is from, Joel, no, is from Bruce Greenwald. And what he hammers away at at Columbia all the time is barriers to entry, barriers to entry, barriers to entry. Because your pricing power and thus your returns on capital are a function of supply and demand. And the only way that you are going to keep supply low enough is to have rational players keeping supply a little bit lower than demand so you can have prices high. And the only way you're going to do that is if people aren't always coming into your market, which they will try to do if you're earning high returns on tangible capital. Because I want those. Everybody wants those. People put money behind that. They build new businesses that, that take you down. So how do you have barriers to entry? The framework from Greenwald is you want two things. You want economies of scale or you want customer captivity. And on economies of scale, what you want is where the largest player in a market can, have, can spend money on R&D, they can spend money on marketing, they can spend money on fielding a sales force, on distributing their product, and have that be a lower percentage of their overall revenues than anybody else. They can make the best products, they can distribute them worldwide, they can give you great service on selling them and on the back end, they can do all of that at a lower percentage of their revenues than anybody coming in. Thus, they can have higher profit margins and deliver a better product than any new entrant coming in. This gives you, when you have these economies of scale, then you can win. Not all businesses can have this, not all industries can have this, but where you do have it, you have an advantage. The other part you want is customer captivity, um, where it is difficult for a customer to switch. So with consumers, you see this a lot of the time with branded consumer goods with like a, a candy bar. It's a small purchase. You buy the same candy bar every day, you know it tastes good, or maybe not every day. You buy, you buy the same coffee every day, whatever it is. If it's a branded product and you're buying the same one every day, it is usually relatively cheap and it is not something that you want to spend your time thinking about. Like, should I save five cents by going down the street to buy this other coffee? Should I do whatever? The consumer doesn't have this top of mind, and thus it is a good business because they stick with it. You see this also with businesses where you've got a product that tends to be a very small portion of customers' spending, and the effort to switch from it is disproportionately high relative to the benefits you get from switching from it. So sometimes this is due to regulatory risks, or regulatory constraints where you have to recertify a new product. Other times, it's just due to the fact that it requires an organization or an individual to expend mental effort for a small gain. When you want to enter a market where that's what your entrenched competitor has, it is very difficult for you to take those customers away from them. So those are the two, the two frameworks that you're generally looking for, economies of scale of some sort and customer captivity. Either one is helpful if you get both of them working together you get even better economics, you get even more sustainable economics, um, and you tend to get higher returns on capital. The other thing that can be useful in this is network economics, where the more customers you have, the more valuable it is for the customers, which brings in more customers, and you have a virtuous cycle. Both of, all, all, all of these things can give you a virtuous cycle. Um, the more of them you get together, the more virtuous the cycle, the more sustainable the economics, and the more you can earn on returns on tangible capital. So I want to look at the business, see if it has any of these characteristics or characteristics that I can understand that allow it to maintain its high returns, the prices that it se sells at, in the face of new entrants. Um, I want to understand that. If I don't understand that, I can't really be comfortable about where this business is going to be in five years or 10 years or 15 years, and you move on. I move on. So the, Again, I'm looking for reasons to kill this idea, but now, I've, like, now I'm spending like, a lot of time reading and, and learning about it. I like to look at the competitors. 
Um, so once I've got a sense for it and I, I like it, I'm going to keep working on this particular company. I want to look at the competitors. I want to look at their biggest competitors, and I want to look at their most aggressive competitors. I want to put them all out in Excel. I want to see the revenues over the past few years, all in the same currency. I want to see their profitability um, over the past few years, and I want to see the returns on tangible capital where possible. A lot of times you're looking at different segments and you don't get all of the disclosure that you want, but you want to put as much out there that you can. And this gives you a couple things. First off, it lets you see like what's going on. Is anybody strong? Is anybody weak? Is anybody like losing share? Is anybody going bankrupt? Um, what's going on in this, in this industry? The second thing that it lets you do, which is very important, is that if you have this theory that this company has economies of scale in distribution, Look at the numbers. It should be growing faster than its competitors. Is it? If not, why not? Is its SG&A cost as a percentage of revenue smaller than its competitors? Like where, where does that test your theory? Where in the numbers does your theory that this company has this particular sustainable competitive advantage, where does that show up in the numbers? And if you can't find it, why not? Is the theory wrong? So use, use the competitors' figures whichever ones are relevant for your theory to test your theory to see if it's, if, if it's really true. And this allows you to go forth confident or kill an idea that would have cost you a lot of money later. Um, so that's, that's, that's the basics of my how do I analyze a business, how do I tell if this is truly a sustainable competitive advantage, how do I know if this, these returns on tangible capital are sustainable. Um, the second thing I want to do is I want to look at the management. I want to look at who are the key players at this company. The CEO almost inevitably is one, maybe the, the board chairman. Um, and I want to look at them. And I'll read the transcripts and see what they're saying about what they want to do and how they want to allocate capital. And the, the thing with, with looking at management is they have two jobs. They need to manage the operations of the business, and they need to allocate capital well. Most managers will fail and result in me turning the page because of capital allocation. Usually, if they suck at operating a business, they got fired a long time ago and they didn't get promoted to CEO. There are going to be exceptions, but that's the usual case. But allocating capital is not something that they've been doing as they rise in the ranks. So that's usually where they're going to fail, and that's usually where I focus my efforts, because again, I'm looking for reasons to kill an idea. What did they say from the transcripts is one thing, but what matters more is what did they do. If you have a CEO with a long period of time, you can evaluate their capital allocation decisions by looking at the return on total invested capital. So that's operating profit after tax divided by invested capital, which is total assets minus current liabilities. That will put in intangibles like goodwill. And if they paid too much for an acquisition, or if they sold a subsidiary or a division for too low of a price, that will show up in your return on invested capital over time. So if you've got a company that over the, like, from before the CEO came on, to now has a marginal return on total invested capital that's lower than 15% after tax, How, why do you think this person is actually good? Um, if it's like 7%, this person probably sucks and, and you move on. But you want, you want to evaluate this capital because whatever the business produces, there is a CEO and a board of directors who stand between you and that money. And if they're going to divert that money into stupid things, you never get it. So it doesn't matter how beautiful this gem is. If you don't get to touch that, that money, it's not worth anything to you. Um, with a spin-off, you don't always have a long period of time to evaluate the CEO. Um, you have the transcripts, again, of what they're saying. What you can try to do is look at whatever segment they were running in the past. How did that perform? It's probably going to be pretty good, otherwise they wouldn't be promoted to this place. Um, but what capital allocation decisions were made for that division? What capital allocation decisions have happened for while this person was sort of running things or influencing the outcome of things? Look at those acquisitions, those divestitures, and look at them and say, well, what did they pay? What did they get? What were the returns? On, what was the tangible capital in that thing that they bought? And what was the multiple they paid for it? If they paid like 50 times and that's after synergies, like why do you want to ride with this guy? Well, this person is probably stupid. But evaluate, like these transactions are very valuable for you because you can evaluate them and say, do I, would I want my CEO doing that? With, like, do this, does this person care about shareholder money? 
Did they care about the tax consequences of this thing or not even close? Sometimes you'll see, oh my gosh, this person's actually very smart. And you wouldn't have noticed that otherwise because they don't trumpet themselves. Other times, you'll read the transcripts and they'll tell you about this great acquisition and you look at it and you're like, that was a terrible choice. Like, why did you do that? So use this as a way to evaluate management. Again, you kill the bad idea and you move on. Happy that you didn't have to ride with this person. Happy that you, know, you learned something useful. And sometimes you'll find something where you're actually impressed and this, this increases your, your interest in the company. So that's, that's how I look at the business. That's sort of how I try to analyze the management, trying to put meat on the bones of good business, good management. Um, th this is what I'm talking about when I, when I use these things that everybody talks about.